Welcome to Inside the Soundwave Internet TV Show, live from the beaches of Indian Atlantic, Florida, where all of your local musicians get to tell their music story from the beginning to the present. And now, here's your host, Mr. Soundwave. Try to, anyway. Hang out with you. Hey! Good evening, everybody. Welcome to show number 37 of Inside the Soundwave, an internet TV show right here on the beaches of Inny Atlantic, Florida at ISW TV Studio and ISW Recording Studio on this beautiful, nice, clearing sky evening after a crap load of rain. <laughs> uh, I, I had to say crap load because it was a lot of rain, but we needed it. We're doing real much. We're doing a lot better now. Tonight, my special guest is Ed Eliason. Eliason. Ed Eliason, percussionist. Would you consider yourself, right? Percussionist? Drummer. Mm -hmm. Drummer. Percussionist. Drummer, percussionist, music educator, drum circle facilitator. Right here, Brevard. Marketing Tony. expert. <laughs> Marketing expert. <laughs> gives lessons right. right here in Brevard. He's, in, uh, he's up in uh, Canaveral, Cocoa Beach area. I was lucky enough to have him come down and do the show with, uh, with me tonight. Uh, a great asset to the county, a, a real true musician, and uh, I'm glad he's going to show us a lot of good things tonight, uh, right here on the show. Um, Ed, yes, say, say hi to people. Hi, folks. How you doing? We Friends, have, family, out of town, out of country. We say hi. We say hi. Uh, we'll say hi tonight up to Spartansburg, uh, South Carolina, to Todd Taylor. All right, Spartanburg. Taylor. Todd's up there, and Mr. Banjo Man. All Todd right, Taylor. Been there. Been there. Yep. Jack Starr, and uh, all my cast of many people from Ron Caddy to David Pastorius uh, to Kenny Cohen, right up to tonight with with Ed right here. Ed, let's get you started. When did we? Right. When did we? When did you get started in this music? Uh, hi, this nice history of music. You Almost had. sixty years ago, uh, my dad was a big band era drummer and played the rimba rimba marimba. Uh, that instrument is now almost 100 years old, and it's in Atlanta in my son's capable hands. He plays way better than I do. My dad, though, played uh, big band era drums, and uh, by the time he came into my life, uh, he, hadn't, he had, hadn't played in years, but he encouraged me to play. I started taking lessons in school in the fourth grade. In Pennsylvania, we had elementary school concert band. So in 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and four years of college, 12 years of classical. I use that word lightly because it doesn't mean just classical, but they call it in the industry classical training. Reading music, playing marching, symphonic orchestras, bands, wind ensembles, jazz bands, small combos. And I started playing in dance bands professionally when I was in 10th grade, 15, we, uh, I had the for good fortune of having two band directors who were jazzers, uh, and they taught us how to go out and make money playing our instruments very early on. We had the same two teachers in one combined school similar to Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High. We had all six grades in one building, one band room, so the same two guys taught us for six years. And out of that jazz band came a quartet called the King's Men. Not the Louie Louie King's Men, that's one word. <laughs> yep. The King's <laughs> Men. Well, it was a guitar, a piano, a trumpet, and a drummer. Now, that wasn't exactly a lineup for a rock band. Right. <laughs> but it was early days of rock, you could get away with it. Mm -hmm. And we dabbled in rock and roll, except for one problem, none of us sang. So we rock and roll without the words. Well, the Ventures kind of did that. Yeah, we weren't that good. So anyhow, <laughs> but the trumpet player was all state band, first chair, solo trumpet for two years in a row, junior and senior year. Quite an honor. The bass player, uh, the guitar player at the time, was also a trumpet player in the school band. Mm -hmm. And we played together. The piano player just retired a few years back after 30 years as a high school band director. And uh, the uh, guitar bass player... He and I went on to play with various rock bands after high school. He's a successful architect up in Pennsylvania. The trumpet player hadn't picked up his horn in 45 years, <laughs> and we got together on emails and decided to perform at our 50th high school reunion oh, up in Pennsylvania in, in October. He went and took lessons. He just retired as a colonel in the Marine Corps Reserves. Oh, wow. And uh, 
he said, I have time on my hands. I'm not doing the reserves anymore. So he went and took trumpet lessons, joined a community band like we have here with our Melbourne Municipal Band. He's playing every week. Uh, they flew down to Winter to Orlando. We went to our piano player's house in Winter Haven, rehearsed for two straight days, played the cocktail hour, 45-minute set of all songs from our senior year. Mm -hmm. Now, funny thing, over the last 50 years, for our first gig in 50 years, three of us now can sing at least a little bit. And we all picked that up after high school when we were sort of forced into having to sing to stay in the business, stay working. And so I got to sing lead on Twist and Shout poorly, but I got through it. And uh, we played up in Pennsylvania, drove up in a minivan full of equipment. I took a keyboard, some PA, some white <laughs> drum set, and all. We had a good time. But, you know, that was, that was a long, long time ago. But high school for me was all about music and horses. I, had, I raised Dad and I raised uh, fox hunting horses. And so I was either riding horses or up in my room banging on the drums uh, whenever I wasn't uh, in school <laughs> or sleeping. I mean, this um, was Pennsylvania, right? Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia, Westchester, Pennsylvania, 30 miles. That's the home of QVC on, on the cable. Right. So that's where they're headquartered now. They weren't there then, but yeah. How long I did you stay up there? For well, I moved to Nashville in 1971. Wow, I graduated cool. from college in 67, mm -hmm. went in the Army for two years, came out of the Army in 69, went to work for Aetna, Life and Casualty, in the insurance industry for two years, got a job offer with Polaroid Corporation, which at the time was uh, just an incredible company. Oh, and that, consumer oh, product, I that consumer that product sales. So I was a weekend warrior playing dance gigs on weekends. They were and, big. Uh, they were huge, and uh, mm -hmm. fortunately we had stock options along mm -hmm. with a nice paycheck, company sure. car, and all the bennies. So right away I knew that music was never going to be my full-time living because I just didn't trust it. I didn't feel I was really good enough to make the big time. Luck wasn't on my side either. We had a record in 1965 that got a lot of local airplay in Philadelphia on the top 40 stations. In fact, I run into people around Florida all the time that grew up in that area that remember the Impalas, the Philadelphia Impalas, not the ones that did Sorry, Uh-oh, I Ran All the Way Home. That was the New yeah. York guys. Right. But uh, we were a, a <laughs> show and dance band. Uh, Rick and Danny, uh, Rick, uh, Rick Jeffries and Danny Kane, the founders of the group, have a very successful pro audio business in Orlando. We have wow. remained tight, close friends since 1965. Wow. In fact, on the way down to the studio, I called them told him to watch the show tonight and said, take a look and maybe you guys want to come over and we'll do a nostalgia show. Oh, that'd be great. With uh, three, uh, three fifths of the Tremendous. Impalas. <laughs> Tremendous. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, we made a lot of friends. And uh, well, I can hope for that to happen. Yeah. That would be really nice. Yeah. Well, we can do that. They're, they're all for it. Now they have both retired from performing entirely. I think they're sissies because I'm two years older than them and I am still doing it although a lot less than I used to, mostly teaching now, and I love that because when you take a kid and you say, this is how you hold the sticks, and the next thing you know, he's making all-county band. Wow. That's an that's, that's incredible. That's the feeling you get from yeah. it. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a It's a great feeling when you see the... Yesterday here, uh, Ed, we had uh, three young 15-year-old ladies here mm -hmm. um, uh, singing called No Drama, Mm -hmm. And uh, be 15 years old. It was th that's it. That's you know that's the next the next group coming in. Exactly. Another one, and we're getting to see it. Well, for example, I worked for a number of years at the Koga Village Playhouse in the orchestra, and they have a program called the mm -hmm. uh, Rising Stars or Stars of Tomorrow. Stars of Tomorrow, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just an amazing program that Stacy Hawkins Smith has put together up there, and it it feeds the adult productions with young talent when you have kids in roles, teenagers, and then they grow up to be adults, and you see a kid in the lead of a show, like Singing in the Rain, uh, and he's doing the dancing, and he's singing, and the kid's an incredible talent. And he started out when he was five years old in Stars of Tomorrow, Coco Village Playhouse, and he's grown up in that theater. Mm -hmm. And that's right here on Brevard, and we have the Surfside Players, Melbourne Civic Theater, Titusville Playhouse, I mean, we are rich. With yeah. that kind of training and, and, in this and, and area. And like you said uh, uh, before, uh, my father-in-law and mother-in-law play in the Melbourne 
municipal band. Band. Okay. And they've been in it for 25 years. Wow. Maybe, you know. Well, then they were there when I was there. (laughs) Yeah, Joe Higdon. uh, Oh, well, Joe. Oh, come on now. You didn't tell me that. That's my, yeah. Well, Joe and I traded the drum chair for a number of years because see that he was living in South Florida, and he came up and <laughs> fell in love with Swing Time, the Swing Time 18-piece authentic big band right. with, by the way, here's what makes Swing Time so great. <laughs> Not only good musicianship, but the music library is authentic. We had a fellow yeah. playing Barry Sachs one year that was an attorney that traveled a lot on business. He went to Boston, and he visited one of the publishing houses mm-hmm. that owned the rights to all of the Glenn Miller Library, I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong on this. The details are fuzzy because it was a while ago and I'm getting old. But anyhow, uh, he went into the publishing house and he said, how much would it cost me to get the original arrangements of Glenn Miller's? And he gave him a list of songs. And the guy said, there is not enough money in the world. They're out of print and we will not reprint them ever. Why? Because it's not cost effective is the answer. Are you kidding me? They own the rights to music that still exists. And all they have to do is crank up the press and print it. Right. But we were very fortunate in having Claire Christie, former First Army Band Washington, D.C., as our conductor for many years. One of the greatest band teachers I've ever had as an adult. Mm-hmm. And I was in my 40s when I started playing with the Melbourne Municipal Band. And my son wow. played alongside me did one New Year's Eve with the Orlando Opera Company. My son, then 15 years old in a tuxedo playing for 1,200 people in in the Marriott World Center in Orlando. It was the thrill of his life. And, but Claire Christie taught me, first of all, he never said the drums were too loud, so right away I loved the guy, right? (laughs) Gotta love a guy like that. But he taught me how to be a percussionist in a 100-piece wind ensemble, which was an amazing experience in and of itself. But Joe came up and I had the drum chair pretty much nailed down, but I was doing a lot of commercial gigs. And so if I had a gig, at that time my kids were coming up. I didn't want to play every weekend. I had gotten out of that. I was just playing a three or four gigs a month and spending the rest of the time being soccer dad and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, they got me into all kinds of crazy stuff. So anyhow, <laughs> but it was all good. And, uh, and Joe came along and I said, Joe, man, you know, I need a sub. I had a high school kid at Mel High that was good enough to sub for me, and he got to play at Pleasure Island twice when I had paying gigs. So mm-hmm. I'd rather make $100 here than drive to Orlando and, uh, and uh, yeah. play for free because it was a volunteer band. Right. We got paid on New Year's Eve, but that's all. A volunteer band, but that swing time is still going strong. He's playing still playing authentic. drums for them. And Joe is, God bless him, man. I don't know how old he is now. He's a few years older I than me. I Joe played at his is, wedding. Um, I think he's 81 or 2 Yeah, now. see, amazing. And a great drummer, has a great feel for the big band stuff. He was a little self-conscious when he first came on because he hadn't played in a while. Mm-hmm. I said, Joe, you grew up with this music. Yeah, you know. I grew up with it through my father. <laughs> yep. But I didn't get to play in a big band until high school. And then only briefly. And then when I lived in Nashville, believe it or not, in Nashville, Vanderbilt University, Blair School of Music, um, has a lot of alumni that are doctors and lawyers because of Vanderbilt's medical and and, uh, legal law school. And so there were two big bands in town. One was called the Doctors. One was called the Lawyers. And they were all Vanderbilt alumni who played big band music and, and just did it for fun. But they didn't need the money, so they'd go out and they'd play these high society soirees and get a thousand bucks and donate, you know, donate it. Yeah. To, they'd pay the expenses of the gig, roadies and stuff, and uh, and there yeah, they had roadies. I had to schlep my own stuff. By the end. <laughs> yeah, like, so yeah, I was a volunteer <laughs> band, and all the money went to scholarship fund at Vanderbilt's Blair Academy of Music. Wow. Eventually, some of the lawyers and some of the doctors started losing interest or dying off or leaving town or whatever. And so they merged and became a band called The Establishment. Mm-hmm. You know, very politically incorrect nowadays, but <laughs> back then it was very cool. All right, we got to take a short break. Uh, don't go away. We've got a lot more with Ed here in the history of, of his, his music history here in Brevard. And... Uh, What he's doing and what he's got going on, you've got to stay tuned and listen to what's going on and what he's involved with doing here. It's great. You've got to hear this, okay? Don't go away. Watch the video of Bob Lambert and Southside Junction coming on right now. We'll be right back in about four or five minutes.
Do y'all like me? Uh, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> All right, well, this next one is called uh, The Kind of Person That You Are. Check, check, check. You tell me, yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell me, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell me, no, 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 no. First, you tell me that you love me. Then you say you don't. Yeah, see, 
I know it, I know it. I see, I told you, man, after 15 years, I can't get something right. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yes, sir. Hey, we're back. Thanks. Thanks for sticking around and watching the show. Ed Eliason is with me tonight from Brevard County, uh, telling us all about his uh, history with percussions and drums. And uh, he's, we just, I just found out he's practically family. <laughs> Small town. Small town. I mean, I met Ed tonight, and here we are, and we got talking, and uh, wow. He knows my mother and father. And the old story is, it's incredible. when you're climbing the ladder of success, be very careful who you <laughs> step on to get to the top because you're bound to meet them on the way down mm -hmm. again. Yeah. And as we all know, in a county of a half million people, 33 years I've been here, wow. you run into people you haven't seen in 25 years. And I've never lived in one place this long. I've lived in Brevard County half my life almost. Wow. And it's amazing. And uh, you run into somebody you haven't seen in 20 years. You're not sure you even recognize him because we all, you know, the last time I said, Kenny Cohen, when did you cut your hair? How long ago did you cut your hair? The last time I saw you, it was down to here. Now, you know, you look a little bit like the rest of us. <laughs> right, right. So, you know. Were you here in the 80s? I moved here in July of 1980. Yeah. Okay. And I, I came from Nashville, although I wasn't in Nashville for the music business. A funny story. I went to work for Polaroid Corporation, oh, yeah, that, and I was hired up in uh, North Jersey, Paramus, New Jersey, and living outside of Philadelphia. Um, I had a job offer, and the guy said, well, we're expanding our sales force, and we need somebody in Nashville, Tennessee. My wife at the time said, I'll relocate anywhere except the Deep South. Why? I don't know, but that's the way she felt. So I went home, and I said, honey, they made me an offer, and they're going to fly us out to where we're going to be living to look for a house, all expenses paid. Mm. We get a weekend in Music City, USA, and she said, where's that? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Sheltered life? No. She grew up with rock and roll. What can I say? Right. So I said, Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> man. We're going to Nashville. She said, is that the Deep South? I said, no, no, no. It's just partway. It's just <laughs> halfway to the Deep South. Now, we're not talking Mississippi or Alabama here. We're talking Nashville, very right. cosmopolitan. Sure enough, our best friends were from Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, we get down there. We meet very few Tennesseans right at first. We did ultimately. But the funny thing is here I've got a company car, an expense account, a wife that can stay at home and raise babies. And I'm doing really great with the day job. And I start going out to jam sessions. And the first thing I heard was, y'all aren't from around here, are you? I said, no. And this one guy says, uh, well, I like the way you play. Who are you playing with? I said, my kids. He said, you mean you're not in the band? I said, no, man, I just moved here. I got a really demanding day job. I travel a lot. I really don't have time to be in a band, but I'd like to do a gig or two a month. And he said, well, you want to go on the road? I said, uh, no, I'm on the road already. I had a lot more money than <laughs> I think you're going to tell me I can make on the road as a musician. So I started hanging out at jam sessions, and when there were too many drummers wanting to play, I picked up a bass one night. Now, I had fooled around with guitar in high school. Why? Because I got bored at rehearsals. They're figuring out how to play and sing a song, and I already know it. So I pick up a baritone ukulele, top four strings of a guitar, and they're, they're working out the chords, and I'm playing along with them on the baritone ukulele. So now I can go to parties and be the star of the party. At the beach, I can take my little ukulele right. and go. So we're all over that, and I started a notebook of songs and chord changes and all that. I can't sing, couldn't then sing then, a little better now, but not much. So anyhow, I'd go into a jam session in Nashville, and I'd say, well, 
you know, I got this uh, four-string harmony tenor guitar, like Nick Reynolds of the Kingston Trio used to play. Nashville never heard of the Kingston Trio. Never heard of Nick Reynolds. And even though he had a Martin tenor guitar, they never saw one before. Wow. And I walked into a jam session, and the guy's first thing I hear is, what happened to the other two strings? I said, I was broke last week. I hopped them. <laughs> Jokes aside, I was able to keep up with all those one, four, five progressions. And I'd say to the one of the guys, what key are we in? E. Okay, okay, no problem. And I knew where every progression was going because it was just that predictable back then. Right. And so some, one night... Um, I was on drums, and we had a really, really killer guitar player from Virginia sitting in. And he says, I'm going to do Misty. I said, really? You're going to do Misty with this bass player who grew up in Nashville? And all he knows is one, four, five. And the bass player, y'all just play. I'll keep up with you. I said, hang on, buddy. Fasten your seatbelt. And we're doing Misty. And, of course, thank God it was a slow song. But he had to slide up and down every string until he found all the notes because the chord changes come like twice a measure sometimes. Right. And he says, oh, my God, where'd that song ever come from? I said, it was written by Eric Garner, who, by the way, could not ever read music. But he composed Misty with all those chords and now all that beauty. When you hear him playing on the piano and you just can't imagine being a schooled musician, for me, it was hard to believe that that man wrote such beautiful music and played so beautifully and couldn't read a note of music. It was just blew my mind. But Nashville gave me a respect for the other part of the music industry, which is the not formally trained musicians, the people that play from here. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with bluegrass almost instantly because I considered it the oh, jazz that's, that's of cool. country music. Yeah. It was just way out over the top musicianship. Banjos, fiddles, mandolins, I'm seeing this stuff really for the first time up close in my life. And I'd already been playing drums probably 20-some years. And I'm, I'm digging this stuff. There's no place for drums. They didn't have a cajon back then, or I could have played no. a cajon. That would have yeah. gone great. So I just table drum. Cajons are cool. Though. And I'd be sitting at the table going, Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. And they said, hey, that's kind of cool. Sit on the drums and play with brushes. Can you use brushes? Yeah, my father was a big band drummer, and he taught me how to drum. Yes, I can play with brushes. Sure. So the big thing was, I uh, can't forget the nice name, on the, the staff drummer on the, uh, Harold Weekly was the staff drummer on the Grand Ole Opry. And he created a technique of using a stick and a brush. And he basically played the cross stick rim shot and, a, and his right hand with a brush. And he'd go, chicka, 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 chicka. And the Nashville train beat, which is really just, he'd get that stick and that brush going. And it didn't matter what kind of country band. When I moved to Nashville in 1971, a set of drums was not allowed on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry. Can you believe that? And Tom T. Hall is the one that broke that rule. He said, I'm, I've been a member of the Grand Ole Opry for blah, blah, how many years? And when I come on that show, I want my whole band, including my drummer, to play. I will not appear on your Grand Ole Opry anymore until you allow me to bring my drummer. And they changed the rule. They dropped the rule. And from that time on, and then the next thing I know, I go to a taping, because we used to go out to the free tapings all the time. All you had to do was stay till they were done and clap a lot, and you got in free. It was cool. So <laughs> I got to see all the big Opry stars for free, you know, and... At rehearsal, and of course, they'd have outtakes and breaks, which were funny and cracked up, make mistakes and all like the rest of us do. It's good to see. So <laughs> here they are up there, and, they're, and, and, they're, and they, all of a sudden they bought Harold Weekly this drum set. And he's like, okay, so what do I do with all this stuff now? And he's still playing the brush and the stick. And they've got like power toms, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, two 18s on the floor or whatever. And 24-inch bass drum and a big deep snare and cymbals all over the place. And there's old Harold Weekly. Now, when, they, when the different acts would come on, their drummer would get up there and play. That was the house drum kit. Harold Weekly, he'd back up the people that didn't come on with a drummer. And he's up there surrounded by, looked like Lars Ulrich, country version. And he'd have a stick and a brush and he'd go, chum, check it, check it, check it. He would play the bass drum. He did play the bass drum. Boom, check it, boom, check it, boom, check it, boom, check it, boom. That 
ta 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 And there it was, man, all over it. And I saw that technique. Marty Stewart, his drummer recently, was playing standing up with a 20-inch bass drum and a snare on a real tall stand and a splash cymbal. And he was standing up singing harmony on one mic with two other guys in the band, Marty Stewart's band. And he had my old Rogers, uh, he had the blue Onyx Pearl. I had the black Onyx Pearl for 45 years I played them. Is that your first drum, by the way? What was your That was my drum? first new drum set. No, my first drum was a Slinger than Radio King Gene Krupa model. There you go. And we sold it. No! Oh. That's why I cry, because it was an ugly ah. green. Yeah, ah. It was an ugly green mother of pearl. I hated it. And I, I still have the snare drum case that I got for Christmas, 1957. So I could carry that drum to school band. And I was ashamed of it. Because right then it was just a 25 or 30 year old drum. It wasn't a collector's item. Hello. And the other guys had all these brand new Ooh, drums. Yeah. Ludwig, Gretsch, Premier, whatever, you know. Well, my first set was a Kent. Kent. I remember Kent. Yeah. Boy, one, of a, one of a gazillion Japanese brands that all came out of the same factory. They were all made by the same factory, and the deal was, if you bought <laughs> enough, true. they'd call it a Spatafora drum kit. They put <laughs> your name on the logo. See? And you just had to buy enough of them, enough and of they'd them. call it whatever you want to call it. Right. And they so say you had Kent, you had Whitehall, which became Pearl, by the way. Mm -hmm. Whitehall was a predecessor to Pearl. They broke away. But yeah. in Taiwan, they were all made in Taiwan. Yeah. And back then, China wasn't making anything, but Japan and Taiwan were making it all in terms of import drums and their symbols were garbage oh, uh, yeah. I mean, in those days if you didn't have a zildjian you didn't have a symbol oh, and that was bad. before sabian came along of course and and ufip and uh, oh gosh you know bosphorus you name it uh, minel minel makes great but sabian stuff. is made by zildjian yeah well the brother <laughs> one of the brothers took off and went to canada and stole yeah. the family recipe i heard but anyhow, no, <laughs> I, I like any <laughs> instrument that sounds good. In fact, we have a thing at our house. We do a recycling program that's a little bit, uh, let's say, not mainstream. Um, at our house, nothing goes in the trash until it passes or fails. Or I should say nothing goes in the trash until it fails the tap test. And the tap test <laughs> works like this. <laughs> Honey, you're not going to throw this away, are you? I haven't played it yet. Yeah, that's a keeper. So that goes into Ed's percussion toy box. Mm -hmm. If it sounds good, I play it. That includes plastic or metal coffee cans. Because when I go into one of the poorest schools in Brevard County, which I want to get to soon. Yes. There's Title I schools where 60% of the kids are on free lunches and get breakfast at school because that's the only decent meal they're going to get all day. These kids are never going to get music lessons. If they don't learn it at school or at church, it ain't going to happen. And they darn sure aren't going to be able to go out and buy a nice shiny new drum set like my private students do. No. Now, if I take a five gallon bucket and a number 10 can, I actually go to school cafeterias and tell the cafeteria ladies, when you're cooking those beans today, just wrench out a couple of those number 10 cans and save them for me. I'll be back later to get them. What's that all about? They're drums for poor kids, okay? Well, I did that for years. And I'd put together drum sets with plastic buckets. I'd go to Walmart and buy the ones in all the tropical colors, the yellows, the aqua colors, and all that. In fact, Brevard Cultural Alliance owns 35 five-gallon paint buckets from Walmart in the musical instrument inventory that I am the user of and caretaker of that have been bought with state grant money on these artist and residence yeah. programs over the last eight, nine years. We get typically four to five hundred dollars every time I get a grant to buy supplies. I'm not a visual artist. We don't use paint and paper. We don't use our supplies. We play our supplies, and then they're good for years. So I've got probably, I don't know, eight to $10,000 worth of instruments that I don't own, that I care for. I maintain them. If a head gets damaged, I replace it at my cost. Why? Because the Cultural Alliance is kind enough to allow me to use them for anything I do in the community. Why? That's why they exist. They don't have room to store them. I do. I rent a warehouse. My <laughs> wife loves it. We need a warehouse. We used to just need a little small storage unit. Now we need a warehouse. Well, 
honey, you know, it takes the place of takes the place out of uh, a big studio like I used to have before yep. the economy tanked. And hey, are you going to play a little? I'm going to take. Yeah, a, I'm yeah. going to take another break right here. Um, we'll play out on the break. How gonna, about that? You're going to play? No, we we'll come back when we come back. Okay. Uh, you're going to go ahead and, and, and yeah. play a little tell bit for them. Tell them about tonight. what you got. Okay. Then we're going to get into what you're doing. Right. Um, here. Yeah. Okay. Good. Because this we're going we're going into the last segment. Good. So I want that brought out to the people. Excellent. To what's Excellent. going on? Don't go away. We'll be right back. We're going to watch another video. Uh, Sunnyland Steve is going to do uh, his next video for you. Watch Sunnyland. We love you, Sunnyland. By the way. I'll be talking to Sunland soon. Can I jump on the drum kit and do like a 30-second demonstration on that and then come back here? Yeah, when we come back from break, don't go away. Is this going to have to come on? I thought the best way to get her to come down would be if I wrote her a really, really special little ballad. And that's how I came to write this song. It's called Meet Me. Living down in the islands Drink rum on the sand all day down goes the sun, put my good shirt on It's down to the club to play A hedonistic lifestyle Some folks say it's a sin But I know that I'm right And I know what I like This is the greatest place I've ever been Come to the islands Meet me in the key I heard your name Just behind the rain Floating on that Florida breeze Woke up Late this morning again With no particular plan Walked down to the beach Caught a coconut Fell right into my hand At sunset I'll be sailing With friends and people I know And long as the wind is blowing There's nowhere that we can't go Come to the islands Meet me in the Keys I heard your name Just behind the rain Floating on that Florida breeze You're the one I'm waiting for The one I'm dying to meet Down from your highlands Down to my islands Make my life complete Come to the islands Meet me in the Keys I heard your name just behind the rain Floating on that Florida breeze
Okay. So, for the first uh, 40, maybe 50 years of my drumming career, that's how I made my living, playing drums. Rock and roll, jazz, blues, country, 10 years in Nashville. Top 40, lots of top 40, records on the radio. Signing autographs at local sock cops, and uh, I thought that was the be-all and end-all of the music world. I played with symphony orchestras, musical theater, uh, opera companies, you name it. And as I say to my students, I've played behind Chicken Wire and I've played behind opera singers, and I enjoyed them both very much. Dixon, Tennessee, about 1978, before Animal House, uh, or Blues Brothers, I should say, came out. I walked into a club with a country band in Dixon, Tennessee, and there was chicken wire in front of the stage. And I, I said to the guys in the band, what in the heck is this all about? And the bar owner heard us, and he said, oh, he said, uh, that's for your protection. You might get wet, but you won't get cut. Oh, it's that kind of place, huh? So along about 2004, I got the great idea that I wanted to retire from my corporate life and do music full time. I had wanted to do that for a lot of years. Honestly, I didn't have the nerve because I was raising a family and educating kids and uh, I just didn't think I could keep enough income coming in every month to depend on music, even teaching and playing. So, I went to work every day and uh, worked in corporate America and corporate sales and marketing for some great, great companies and for some not so great companies. Towards the end, I gradually ramped up my private teaching at night and worked in the day until I could build a program that would give me enough monthly income to stop working day jobs altogether. And that program was called the Drum Club. I became an enrichment sponsor for the School Board of Brevard County and their aftercare program, which involved going to elementary schools where they had daycare, which is most of them and doing a program for the kids that the parents paid for. And mine was called the Drum Club. I had two classes at five different schools, so I was working two hours a day at one of five elementary schools, Monday through Friday. So 10 classes a week. I had a total of about 80 kids enrolled the first year. And I sold uh, a package uh, for each enrollee with a t-shirt, a drum club t-shirt, a pair of drumsticks, a practice pad, and a book that I had written called The Drum Club Handbook for K through six, learning to read music and play percussion. With the older kids, I focused on preparation for middle school bands, snare drum, tom-toms, and bass. We simulated a drum line I had three or four snare drums, one bass drum, which two people played facing one another so that we had a double bass drum effect, and then tri-toms, which were rotor toms, one floor tom-tom as a deep tenor, and, uh, and a pair of crash cymbals. So we did that with the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and they, they learned how to read music uh, very quickly, and they had some neat little drum line experiences. But that wasn't going to work with the younger kids. You can't take a bunch of kindergartners and turn them loose on snare drums, bass drums, and crash drums. So I had to find an alternative that would work. And as it turns out, in the aftercare program, there are more younger kids than older kids because the younger kids need aftercare. The older kids go home and either stay by themselves or with a neighbor or something until mom and dad get home from work. So I turned to hand percussion. Now this drum here, is an Egyptian dumbek. It's a fiberglass shell. This drum is sold by my friends across in West Melbourne at Mideast Manufacturing. But Remo makes the head. Now, the fiberglass shell gets shipped over from Egypt, and there's a patented secret way that they apply the heads that they will not tell me about. <laughs> Don't blame them. But it gets an amazingly high pop. This is a drum called a dumbek that's popular all over the Mideast primarily used for belly dancing, but for all celebrations and in all Middle Eastern music, you'll hear the dumbak. <laughs> now the head that's on this drum is made by Reno and it's made to look like an animal skin. Actually, this is simulated fish skin. 
fish skin. They actually use fish skin on dry as drum heads in the Middle East, along with goat skin, which is the most common. Now, a djembe, this is a Remo djembe, which is bolt tuned, synthetic heads. In Florida, living by the beach, humidity is a constant problem. I love traditional African djembes. I love calfskin congas, but they don't like the humidity. They go soggy. I'm outdoors doing a drum circle or an event, and my drums are sounding like uh, cardboard boxes within an hour. So I use almost exclusively synthetic heads, which brings me to the Remo line of drums and this great Remo head that goes great with this fiberglass conga. I mean, <laughs> Dumbe, very lightweight. The djembe is a 16-inch Remo. This is a Leon Mobley version, and he's become a friend through Facebook, and we chat a lot. He's one of the Remo-endorsed uh, drummers, percussionists. And uh, I am soon to become uh, an official Remo Endorsed Drum Circle facilitator through all the training I've gotten from them. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So I go in and do my drum club, 2004. I got 80 kids, two classes a day after school. And uh, I bring in a truckload of drums, a carload of drums on my cart. And we, we have like 20 kids in a class, and we're whacking on tambourines and small drums and big drums and shakers and rain sticks and all kinds of cool stuff and we make up songs or we sing songs that they know now one of the things that's fun with little kids is to take children's songs and rearrange them into a cool modern beat for example there's a little song that your kids probably know called itsy bitsy spider now itsy bitsy spider all the little kids know that itsy bitsy spider what I couldn't sing, and I don't believe I just did this on internet TV. So anyhow, I do a little different version which the kids get a kick out of. So we rearrange it into the funky little spider, and we put a funk groove behind it. second I do a lot with disabled kids and adults. Now I've empowered them through a process that Remo trained me in called group empowerment drumming. They've never been able to play an instrument in their life and suddenly within 30 seconds they're playing. They're playing. They're not being entertained. They're not fumbling around with a recorder trying to make it sound like something. They're drumming a beat to a song they already know. Familiarity with the music makes it easy. Now, if I were to go in and say, hey, guys, I'm going to teach you an African song. This is an African djembe song. They'd say, well, wow, Mr. E, because that's what they call me. They'd say, wow, Mr. E, you really play that great, but I don't know that song. And I don't know how to play that song. So, you know, I am what they call not ethno-specific in the music I teach. I will teach them traditional Brazilian, Afro-Cuban, Afro and Puerto Rican music, and Dominican Republic, merengue. I'll teach them those forms, but not until I've taken them through the fundamentals of how to drum. The low note is in the middle, and the high note is on the edge. So we call that a bass tone, an open tone, and then there's a third note called a slap. The open tone and the slap sound almost identical. On a goat skin head, they sound different. On a conga, they sound different. So we'll go and we'll do. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I like to eat, eat, eat ketchup on my French fries. I like to eat, eat, eat happy meals and milkshakes. We'll go to McDonald's for breakfast. What do you like? I like to eat. Pancakes and sausage. I like to eat, eat, eat orange juice and yogurt. Yay! There's a healthy choice. So we use familiar things. We make up songs. And I'm going to ask McDonald's for some royalties one of these days. I'm going to send that song to him. 
Maybe we'll send them a copy of the video. We'll do it full length. <laughs> I should bring in a group of kids. So, as a teaching artist with Brevard Cultural Alliance, about eight years ago, I started participating in a program called the Artist in Residence Program. There are only a few musicians that are doing this because you have to write lesson plans, you have to follow the Sunshine State standards for music education, which for me was easy and fun and lucrative because now I've developed a full curriculum of world beat music and rhythm for grades K through six and nothing of its kind exists to my knowledge. I've been all over the internet anywhere in this country. So I've got, don't you steal my idea now? Well, you haven't seen the whole book so there's not much to steal. I have a marketable product which I'm going to donate to the school board of Bavard County for use in our elementary schools. To use that as a test market because I've already worked in dozens of probably 50 out of the 70 elementary schools and use this curriculum and it works. It works. The school teachers love it because it supplements what they already teach. When they can get a kindergarten kid class drumming together with something as simple as one, two, cha cha cha, one, two, cha cha cha. Funny thing is, I'll go into Publix. Uh, you owe me some money, Publix, for that plug. Okay, I'll go into a grocery store, and some little kid and his family will come up, and the little kid's tugging on my shirt, Mr. E, Mr. E, and I'll grab the nearest thing that I can make a sound with, and I'll say, let's play. One. And they're singing, and they're clapping, and they're clapping, and they're slapping their knees, and they're stomping their feet, and the parents are saying, who is this crazy old fogey? And what's he doing with my kid? And then the next thing you know, mom's singing. One, two, ta ta ta. Or I say, been to a wedding recently? I know you know this one. So, vocalization and drumming. It's all rhythm. Baba Tunde Olatunje is the father of African music in the United States. He came over here in the 60s to go to college to become a diplomat for his country in Africa. He never did that. He graduated from college and became a full-time African Trump teacher, the first one of any renown in this country. And he worked with friends of mine such as Arthur Hill, the father of the American Drum Circle mu movement. And I missed working with him because he died before I got into this. But I would have loved to have met him because I've watched his videos and they are inspiring. Your hands are your instrument. You take care of your instruments. Oh, I forgot my little clippy mic. Does that mean they haven't heard me? Oh, yeah, they heard you. They heard me good. All right, so here we go. Baba will say that you play from the heart and not from the head, okay? But the European slash American form of teaching music is give the kid a page of notes and rest and say, now we're going to learn this song. Six months later, the kid still can't play it, and he definitely can't play it without the music. I worked with a keyboard player one time that graduated from the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. And if you're watching, I won't mention your name. I don't want to embarrass you, but we had a gig one night and we had sheet music for every song on our set list. Somebody came up and said, can you play Happy Birthday for my brother? Sure. And Phil says, where's the sheet music? I said, Phil, it's Happy Birthday. You went to the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. You got a degree in composing and arranging. Let me play it. So I jumped off the drums and sat on the keyboard and picked it out one note. Happy birthday. I said, Phil, you can sing. Oops, I said his name. I didn't mean to. He lives out of state now, but you go everywhere. So anyhow, sorry, Phil, I love you. You know that. So anyhow, readers was like my mother. She could read anything. She was a Sunday school piano player. My dad could read because he'd been trained to play drums, but he also could play from the heart. My mother was another one, couldn't play Happy Birthday by ear. I would sit down at the piano, which I refused to take lessons on. Big, dumb mistake. And I would sit down, and a kid in college taught me a triad chord. And I could play C, A minor, F, and G. Now, I do it backwards. I play the chords with my right hand and play the bass note, the tonic, or the, what is it? The tonic? Yeah. With my left hand. And I go... And that will get me through about 8,574 50s oldies slow songs. C A minor F G. Great progression. 
And then I can also do the 145, I can do Louie Louie, I can do a whole bunch of songs, but don't ask me to read piano music. I learned how to play mallet percussion so that I could teach it. But I'm slower than my students. I get them in the book, I show them the first page, we start working on scales, I said, now go home and practice. I don't get time to practice, so by the second lesson they know more than I do. That's okay, I know when to pass them off to a better mallet teacher if they want to pursue it. But I get them far enough to start them in seventh grade. Now, the main reason I wanted to be on this show tonight was to tell you a little bit yeah. about not only what I do with Brevard Cultural Alliance in traditional classrooms, music classrooms around Brevard County, but what I have been blessed to be able to do with the disabled community over the last uh, six years. Janice Kershaw is now executive director of Brevard Schools Foundation. She is a former chairman of the Brevard County School Board. She became a friend about uh, five or six years ago when she was executive director of VSA Brevard, which is the local chapter of a national and statewide organization, VSA Arts, which stands for Very Special Arts. These are kids from mild learning disabilities up to profound physical and mental disabilities. They are often grouped together. So you have a Down syndrome child, an autistic child, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, uh, dyslexia, something as, as minor as dyslexia compared to the other kids. But I was a little dyslexic when I, uh, when I was a young child. I learned later because they didn't have a name for it back then, but I would get things backwards sometimes. I could read fine, but I would sometimes get things backwards. But you know what kept me straight? One, two, three, and four. One and two and three and four. And one he and a two he and a three he and a four. I never got that mixed up. Never, ever, ever. And so my new CD, which will be coming out this summer, uh, will be called 60 Years and Still Counting. Because if you can't count, my friend, you can't play with another musician. It's just that simple. So you're disabled. Now put yourself in the place of an eight-year-old child with Down syndrome. They are the most fun people to work with in the world, children or adults. Janice Kershaw hired me to go in for a 13-week residency at Brevard Achievement Center, mm. well, which is disabled adults who get vocational and independent living training every day. They learn jobs and they get a paycheck every week. They do things like stuffing envelopes, they do light janitorial work. They work in my wife's building at NASA. Uh, they have crews that go out and work at local companies doing menial tasks that they've been trained to do. They do a lot of in-house projects with the ones who are better off staying put right there at the center. They come by public transportation, most of them every day. Many of them live in group homes. They're taught how to balance a checkbook. They're taught how to do a lot of this stuff. Some of them can't even do that. They can't learn. But I worked with one autistic gentleman who was in his mid-50s and had been raised a closet baby at that center. And the most amazing thing happened. Uh, he'd been there 20 years and he'd never spoken a word. He's what they call a nonverbal. Many autistics are, many aren't, because there's a wide spectrum of levels of ability in the autism spectrum. This gentleman could not speak. Well, nobody knew if he could or couldn't. We all suspected that he could, just didn't want to, and that's usually the case. So the first three or four weeks, it was a 13-week program. I had the same six classes for an hour once a week. The first three, he sat there like a statue, legs crossed, hands folded in his lap. He was never disruptive. But the loud playing, when it got loud, it bothered him because there, he was hypersensitive to sounds. So we kept him over to the side where he wouldn't be near the louder drums, and I put quieter drums near him. We arranged the room for his needs. So here's this fella, and uh, I've been given permission to write an article about him, and it's been published by Remo on, in their website. But I won't use his first name on TV because I, I don't want to abuse my privilege of using his name in the article. But this gentleman had worked with the same caseworker there for 12 years. Mm -hmm. She had felt that she had made good progress with him, but he was still pretty much antisocial and nonverbal, which are two of the main focuses, our main um, disability issues with autistic people that are well into the autism spectrum. 
Well, we're six weeks in, and he touched an instrument for the first time. His aide would sit with him and play an instrument and then try to hand him a stick or a mallet. We gave him a very small Remo sound shape, which is a flat saucer like instrument, and you play it with a small mallet or stick. The smaller ones are very, very quiet. The bigger ones up to 16 inches sound like a nice little bass drum groove. But we gave him a small one, maybe a six or eight inch, which is quiet and a little mallet, little foam rubber mallet. And she would play along with us, playing happily along our merry way, singing goofy songs that we make up, or singing real songs that we don't make up, like, Who let the dogs out? Woof, woof. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I said, Woof, there it is. Woof, there it is now. If you're an adult or a teenager, you can get into that because we go through like half a dozen hip-hop songs. If you're a little older, I do a disco set. We are family, my brother and my sister and me. We are family. Ooh, 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 ooh. Staying alive, staying alive. And, you know, who can't get into that? So <laughs> I pick music that's generationally significant to the people because familiarity breeds success. So here's this gentleman, wouldn't touch an instrument, six weeks into a 13-week program. The seventh week, we're doing a relaxation exercise. Now, you got to see this to understand it, but this is a, an evidence-based protocol from Health Rhythms with Remo that is for stress reduction. Stress reduction involves quiet, ambient percussion, ambient percussion where there's no rhythm, there's just atmospheric sounds, like the wind. We have an ocean drum that simulates the sound of the surf. We have rain sticks, we have wind chimes, all non-rhythmic percussion instruments, ambient percussion. And we go through a process called guided imagery drumming. And I ask the people to close their eyes, picture themselves at the most beautiful place they've ever seen or can imagine. Maybe it's a beach, maybe it's a cabin in the mountain. There's a gentle breeze blowing. And then suddenly a few raindrops. And somebody's playing the rain stick. And maybe the ocean drum. And maybe somebody's playing the wind chimes very gently. If it's at the beach, we do the surf like this with the ocean drum. Goes out, comes back in. Tide goes out, comes back in just using our fingernails. All of a sudden, right in the middle of this, Bill, I said his name and I didn't want to, spoke up and he says, Brian, can you play the rain stick a little louder? I can't hear it. Whoa. First words anybody at Brevard Achievement Center had ever heard cross this man's lips. I could not fully appreciate the impact of that because it was my very first assignment working with disabled people. The day I started my program, I asked the question, can you tell me what autism actually is? That's how much experience I had. They gave me a pamphlet from the state of Florida about working with the disabled. It was really all about political correctness. We never used the word retarded. You're not retarded, you're disabled. We never use the word handicapped because you're not handicapped. You simply have different abilities, a different level of abilities. You're disabled, and I don't even like disabled because I have a big sign with the circle and the hash mark through it over the word letters DIS. When I go in to work with a group of kids, I said, What do they call you guys anyhow around here? What are the other students? How do they treat you? What do they call you? And the little kid will say, they call me a retard. I said, that hurts, doesn't it? That's like when people call me fat, even though I am, and I could lose the weight. You know what I say? Hey, I'm fat and you're ugly. The difference is I can lose weight. Ah, what are you going to do? Suck off. Here you go. And I get away with it because I'm 6'3", 300 pounds. I get away with it, huh? Okay, so... I say, what do the kids call you? Does that hurt? What if I picked a different word to describe you? What would that word be? You tell me what I should call you. And this one little adorable kid, Matt, 
His parents gave me permission to use his name in all my publicity because I love this kid to death. If he didn't have parents, I'd adopt this kid. He's got cerebral palsy. Can't stand up. He's strapped in a wheelchair, and I have never seen this kid without a grin from ear to ear on his face. And it's a Christian school, and he goes to Calvary Chapel in Melbourne, and he was singing along very loudly to a Christian video uh, one day when I walked in to set up the drums. And I said, Matt, can we drum to that video? That's pretty cool. And we're singing at the top of our lungs, all of us that could. Some of them can't, and some of them can't drum. But I have these little Velcro straps that I made. And if I have to Velcro a, a maraca to that kid's hand, they're going to play. They're going to play an instrument. We had one little girl over there paralyzed from the neck down. She's in a wheelchair with a tray in front of her. You've seen them. She blows on a little tube, and her hands that are in, her arms are in slings, and they're able to move like this so that she can keep the muscles from atrophying. So she does that every couple minutes. She'll blow in the tube. And I walked in, and, and the staff says, well, she can't. She won't be able to participate. She's paralyzed from the neck down. I said, yeah. What's she doing? What are her arms doing? Oh, well, she blows in that tube, and her arms do this. I said, yeah, she's got a tray in front of her, right? So I pick up a set of bongos. I lay them down on their side. Well, and as her hands come up, she just makes the slightest little contact with the bongos, enough she could hear it. Grin goes up from ear to ear. I had never seen her smile before. Oh. She is now playing music with her classmates. She is profoundly physical disabled. She ain't getting better. Mm. These kids aren't getting better. They may get worse, and right. they probably will die young. Yep. But for the time being, they can make music with their friends. That's, 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 great. that's, uh, that's what it's about. And that is, for me, what it's become. I have literally, and I'm not blowing smoke because a lot of guys have done what I've done and much more. Yeah, I've done Disney, I've done Epcot, I've done Pleasure Island, I've done the cruise ships and all that kind of stuff. And back in the 60s, I got to play at the Philadelphia Rock Festival in front of 20,000 fans. And we were an opening act for the Young Rascals. Back then, they were the Young Rascals. And they got older, they dropped the young. And I uh, got to meet Dino Donnelly, phenomenal Dino. drummer. One of my heroes at the time. One of my heroes, time. too, yeah. man. Phyllis Cavallari on B3. Oh, what a group. And I'm, I'm sitting right next to them because we opened and our drum sets were literally side by side. And the way the opening act went, you segued into one of their songs. So we did our opening set, maybe 20, 30 minutes, and our final show was pre-planned in their key. And it was uh, Young Rascals, come on, uh, was it Beautiful Morning? One it's of their a beautiful It's a beautiful morning. Yep. And I'm thinking, how could this drum groove be any easier? I mean, this guy's a big star, but he's not going to outplay me on this song. Oh, yeah? Watch. <laughs> I wanted to break my fingers after watching Dino. <laughs> so I got a lesson that day. And you know what about lessons? I'm 68 years old. In 12 days, I'm going to turn 69 years old. And this is my 60th anniversary playing drums, 60th anniversary year. I don't do as many gigs, per se, traditional gigs I used to, because I love teaching and I love sharing what I know with other people. And I love working with the disabled. Now, Sue Lulai will absolutely hang me if I don't put in a plug for the Space Coast Music Festival. Right. September 28th. I know she'll be here in a couple of weeks or so. With Sheila. Right. And so last year I was doing a drum circle there at sunset, which is cool because the sun sets over the Banana River. It's over a mile wide. We get that long lingering sunset over mm. the water. And there's our drum circle. And that was a great highlight for me, but I was also a vendor there, and I met a lot of great people, signed up some new students, uh, sold a few things, and it was a great experience. So this year awesome. I volunteered to be on the planning committee. And I said, Sue, there's one thing I want to do. I said, this past school year, I worked in 135 special ed classrooms across Brevard County with 1,300 plus kids that have learning disabilities, all the way up to severe, profound physical and mental disabilities in the public schools. Now, among those 135 classrooms, maybe a dozen were private academies, private schools, like No Limits in West Melbourne, right. like uh, Creative Learning Center in Cocoa, that are privately run 
and they supplement what the schools do. Sometimes they get the kids that they can't work into a mainstream classroom in a school. So as a result, I personally have worked with, 13, uh, with 135 plus special ed teachers plus the aides. And some of these classes will, they have a teacher who's the teacher, but then they have to have an aide for every two or three kids because the kids need that almost one-on-one -on -one attention to get through the day right. to learn. They do a lot of arts, and VSA Florida is, is part of VSA National Organization that brings art to special needs children and adults. It brings visual and performing arts. I think the painters, uh, Glory Emily does sculpture and painting. Some people do mosaics. The, the children and the adults both get into visual arts, but they love music. They love, love, love music. And I'm making competition for myself. I've done this residency twice out of the last three years. I said, why are they asking me back so quickly? Because I just did this two years ago, mm -hmm. and they've got tons of artists that want to do it. She said, because the teacher said they want you back because the kids absolutely love it. And they do. And I can go into a room full of 20 disabled children that run the gamut from as simple as a little reading problem all the way up to autism and I can say everybody sing now I go to Sherwood elementary school I go to Sherwood I go to Dr. W.J. Creel W.J. Creel Creel Elementary Melbourne Florida that school has five exceptional ed classes five I was there a whole day working with all five classes and we sing the name of the school sing your name my name is Will Spadafora. Good morning, Will Spadafora. So our opening exercise is, I'm Mr. E, kids. We're going to drum. Good morning. Now, my name is Mr. E. Come on and drum with me. Can you do that with me? Can you just do that with me, Will? Can you play on the table? Play on the table here. My name is Mr. E. Come on and drum with me. Now you respond back. Good morning, Mr. E. Come on and drum with me. Okay, so it's a call and answer, <laughs> which is an, uh, a very old musical form. Uh, has its roots in every culture in the world. So, my name is Mr. E. Come on and drum with me. And bam, they're drummers. They're, they just became drummers with just that. Now let's sing the name of your school. Oh, we go to Columbia Elementary. Columbia Elementary. And where is it? It's in Palm Bay, Florida. Palm Bay, Florida. So vocalization and rhythm. As Baba Tunde Olatunji said, if you can say it, you can play it, Mon. Well, he didn't say Mon because he wasn't from Jamaica. He was from Ghana, I think. But a great man, a quiet spirit, a peaceful mm. man who just played. Where can these people, uh, how, can they get, how do they get a hold of you? Say well, they can find me on Facebook at Ed Eliason. I also have a group page, Good to Groove Music. Uh, my website is temporarily down uh, for rebuild, but it will be back up. Um, I don't want to necessarily push the retail side, but we do uh, offer incredible student discounts and good pricing and great customer service. I had a big studio a year ago with five qualified teachers, two of them degreed um, in music education, and we had to close down because of the layoffs at the Cape. We were on North Merritt Island, mm. right by the B-Line. And had 2,500 square feet. I had a consignment shop in there for people to buy and swap and sell used equipment, which fit right in with the bad economy. You right. know, pick up something used instead of new, get rid of what you don't need. And that part of the business did okay. The student enrollment, the whole year we were there, just gradually tumbled down with the layoffs at the Cape. Right. I talked to louts and other people up there that do music lessons. Everybody in that area, including Melbourne people, were suffering. Uh, steady losses in private students. Private lessons have become out of the budget for too many families, right. people that are downsized. And so we do That's classes it. now. Pete Martin, who was in the other day, was does a great day. job. We're getting ready to start classes in Cocoa Beach at the rec center. I'll do a hand drumming camp for kids. When's this? You know when? July. It'll be uh, every Wednesday in July. Every Wednesday, every Wednesday in July, July. And you can contact me or the rec center, Cocoa Beach Rec Department. Laird uh, McLean is the rec director, 
and they'll give you information on signing your kids up. It's very reasonable, extremely inexpensive because it's family friendly. Everything I do has got to be family friendly. Remember now, that's good to groove music. Find us on Facebook. (laughs) Facebook. It's easy to find on Facebook. And, uh, of course, you even have your own page, too. My own page, Ed Elias, and I welcome people to uh, friend request me on uh, my personal page and or the can, business page. You can get one. information, I'm sure, yeah. there, too. I regularly post all our activities. Not only that, oh, I almost forgot. A couple months ago, did Anthony Darmana is a moving and shaking a force. You should have him on a show. Uh, he and his wa- uh, girlfriend, Lisa, are just opening a shop called the Love Hut in North Melbourne. And... Uh, he and I have done a lot of drum circle type work together. Oh. We set up a page, a band page, on Space Coast Live. Okay. And it's called Space Coast Drum Circles. So if you go to Space Coast Drum Circles, you will see a listing of every public community drum circle in the Brevard County area. They only let you cover Brevard County. Right. That are held on a regular monthly basis. Third Saturday, Pelican Park, drum circle on the beach. No kidding. Bonfires when it's not turtle season. Now it is. So wintertime we have bonfires on the beach by city permit, satellite beach. We're going to be starting that in Cocoa Beach very shortly because the rec department is hot about it. And and I'm in now with my classes, so I'll be doing them up there. Second Friday at Friday Fest in Melbourne, the Melbourne Drum Tribe has been doing a community drum oh, yeah, circle I, for I know, years. Yeah, yeah. Eight, Second ten years. Friday, Second Friday, downtown, Friday Fest. Downtown. Anthony Darmana has his own drum so- circle at a, at a club over in downtown Melbourne every Thursday night. So Space Coast Drum Circles is the generic gathering place for information on anybody that lets me know what they're doing. I'll post it on there. So you can always find a community drum circle. Check it out. Typically with loaner drums available. You do not need to own a drum. When I do a drum circle, my trailer is in the parking lot with good to groove music all over it. You can't miss it. And it's full of drums. Now, I used to schlep them all down on the beach by myself. I learned very quickly to just take my drum down on the beach. Maybe one extra and my chair and my water. And when you show up, We'll walk up and we'll grab a couple drums for you and your friends. Right. And you can bring a bring couple extra down. down. Yeah. And they all get down to the beach. And before you leave, you take them back. So it works. It's community. It's about building community. you got to check it out now. Look at You have to check it out. It's really, really simple. Uh, get the groove music. Ed Eliason right here on Facebook. You can see him on Facebook. Uh, Space Coast. Drum Circles. Drum Circles. And you can catch that on Space Coast. Live. Live music calendar. Music calendar. www.spacecoastlive.com. He's got a lot more to tell us. I'll have that on again uh, down the road very shortly. With a group, maybe. With a, we, we'll, yeah. we're we're going to do something. Uh, we'll have them on. Uh, maybe uh, we'll put you on the sound stage. That'd be kind of nice. Yeah. We could do that. We could bring some kids in and do a drum circle. Drum a circle. A little mini one. We could do something different. Yeah. We can do that way. We can do it our drum circle. There you go. We put it right on. The in ISW there. drum circle. We'll do that. Sounds Thank great. Thank you for being here Thank tonight. Thank you, Will. Ed. Thank you very much. It, it, was, it was an great honor to have you here, man. It was really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Watch the show. It'll be up and running probably by 10 o'clock p.m. All the time. You can watch it anytime, 24-7, iswtvstudio.com or iswmusicstore.com, Inside the Soundwave. And there's all kinds of special shows on there you can see. Now, Ed will have his own guest lit a name on there as a guest on the show and you just click on his name and you'll be able to watch the show anytime you want <clears throat> thank you god bless you all we'll be back next god week god bless folks thank you be safe enjoy the beautiful weather that's coming our way now god bless you take care